Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today we have Steve Baker with us. Steve is Vice President of The Great Game of Business Incorporated. He's co-author of Get in the Game, How to Create Rapid Financial Results and Lasting Cultural Change. And he's co-author of the 20th anniversary edition of The Great Game of Business, which was a foundational book for me decades ago when I first discovered it. Uh, It was originally published in 1992, and that book was uh, profound for me in the early days of my businesses in terms of learning the concept of open book management and getting the whole team on the same page and and not having so much information asymmetry. So uh, Steve runs the consulting side of the great game of business. He's helped many companies to implement open book management. Steve is also a top rated speaker and coach on these topics, open book management, strategy, execution, leadership, employee engagement. And it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Stefan, thank you. It's an honor to be here. So let's first of all, define for our listeners who are not familiar with that term open book management. What is it and why should they care about it? Well, it's a great question because if everyone understood it, I think we'd be in a better place right now. But uh, open book management is often thought of as uh, the idea of uh, cracking open the financials and getting people uh, engaged around the numbers. Um, The interesting thing is, is there are a lot of people who are quote unquote transparent with their employees and that, you know, they get up at the podium once a quarter and say, well, our results from last quarter suck. So get back to work, you know, all historical information. The way we look at open book management is what if we could teach people on the front line of the business who actually create the numbers in the business to actually take ownership of the numbers that they produce, forecast them every week, and help the company actually become better. So they actually think and act and feel more like the owners do than than a frontline worker. Right. So acting like an owner, as in they, uh, they're operating off of the same score sheet that yeah. the executives, the, the owner is operating off of. Yeah, I mean, look, let's face it. Here's the thing. I mean, in the pre-show uh, uh, time that we had together, sort of in the green room, so to speak, Stefan, we were talking about my background and everything. And in, in my previous life, I'm just telling you that it was not uncommon to be out there thinking you were winning in business, right? Making decisions every single day on behalf of the company in sales and branding and marketing, right? Working with the biggest retailers in the world. And then years later, finding out that the best deal you ever made, the company lost money on. <laughs> and, it, and it only came down to, we got to see down to margin, nothing else. Or we weren't, what we were doing was selling stuff, typically stuff nobody needed. And we had no idea that we were really supposed to be building a great company. And so the stuff I was worried about was, and think about this, almost anyone listening has probably felt this at one point in your life, you know, can I make my mortgage payment or my rent? Can I pay for the cars? What about the tuition and braces and medical bills and that, right? All that stuff. And will I have a job tomorrow? That's a big deal, especially right now. Well, what does an owner worry about? They work about, worry about cash and competition and material cost, labor cost, all the stuff about building a great company. Well, those are two terribly different things. And all the great game of business is about an open book management is saying, hey, if you want all this stuff, job security and raises and bonuses and all that good stuff. Well, that comes from a growing, sustainable and and profitable business. Well, so why don't we teach them what creates a great company and they'll get everything they want. So that's where the idea comes from. Are we thinking like employees, take care of me, you owe me, or are we thinking like owners, like entrepreneurs, let's take this risk, let's go after it. And absolutely transform my life. I mean, the understanding of, oh, now I know why I'm working so hard. I didn't have any visibility before. So we're just asking people to treat their employees like adults. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it, it creates alignment and, and uh, a shared common goal and, and outcome and common kind of enemy or, or villain. It just gets everybody on the same page. Yeah, that's where the whole game really centers around is this idea of a critical number. This one thing that, that we can all focus upon. And it may be a weakness that we need to drive out of the business. 
So um, your listeners might not know Jack Stack like you do, but you remember the story. So Jack Stack and 12 other managers bought a dying division of International Harvester way back in 1983 because they were the best in the world at what they did, remanufacturing engines and engine components. No one cared except them, of course. Best in the world, but International was going out of business, laying off a thousand people a week back then because it was another black swan, another terrible economy, right? And they weren't competing globally, just a, just an awful story. So Jack and, and these managers, they said, we got to save these 119 jobs here in Springfield, Missouri. They went out and got financing. Now it took them 54 different banks to take on an 89 to one debt to equity loan because they needed 9 million. And they only had hundred thousand dollars down, but they did get it. And along that path, a year and a half of struggling with lenders to find somebody, you know, who was desperate enough to take it. Well, Jack learned that he had the wrong scorecard. All these years of working in manufacturing, he had the wrong, he had, you know, great warranty rate, best safety record in the country, on-time delivery, customers, right? Banks didn't care. They wanted to know when you're going to pay the money back. So he learned that universal language and he figured out everyone on the line should know the language as well because they couldn't make a $10,000 mistake. And, uh, and that's the big idea. The critical number then was make the bank loan payment because if they didn't do that their quality on time delivery warranty rate none of that mattered the bank would come in and take it away jack knew every single person on the line knew what happened if you didn't make your mortgage payment if you didn't make your car payment right bank could take it back he just applied it to business and the first scorecard was 8.9 million dollars on this side of the time clock hundred thousand on this side he said let's move one dollar over here to the hundred thousand dollar side right the idea of balance sheet <laughs> just very simplified. And what he realized was this language, a secret language of business wasn't new. These financial statements that we still use today were created by Luca Pazzioli in Venice in 1494. Haven't changed in 500 years. <laughs> so for me, as a guy who's learned this late in life, it's been absolutely mind blowing because I'm trying to teach my kids as fast as I can. I go, wait a minute. We're looking at the wrong scorecards, guys. Let's figure out how we can teach you how to manage money. It will absolutely change how you live your life. Amazing. And uh, yeah, I remember the story in the book when I read, uh, read it the first time in the 90s and uh, just imagining that big uh, lit up board with the number that everybody on the uh, on the line could see that everybody from uh, the night shift, the janitor and on would, would be able to know, did we hit our number yet? Are we going to be able to pay the bank? Yeah, for sure. And the, thing, the funny thing is, is that if Jack would have just come out and put a big blazing number out there and say, we got to hit that number, you're out of a job. That's one conversation you could have. Or you could say, Here's the enemy, like you said, you pointed out, you could have a common enemy. And it was like, this is the weakness in our business. To have a great company, we can't have debt like this. Let's go after it. And sure enough, people will rally to something like that, a common goal where we all have something. But the problem is what Jack ran into and anyone will run into is when you have great technicians, and I don't mean machinists and mechanics and engineers necessarily, but it could be doctors and it could be artists and it could be anyone who's in business. And you say, hey, great technician. I want to teach you about the financials. Yahoo! You know, and they're yeah. going to go, ah, ah, ah. Hey. I'm an artist. I'm a healer. I'm a machinist. You know, let the bean counters do that stuff. And Jack had to use this analogy of a game because he knew everybody was competitive. Everybody likes to win. So the great game of business was simply a way for him to teach people the numbers without it being intimidating. He said, why does it have to be an elite sport? Why can't we demystify business and make it approachable where we can actually make a difference, change some lives. And what he sees is the American dream. And I would agree with it is everybody has a shot. We all have a shot. What are we going to do with it? Yeah. It reminds me of uh, the concept in software development called gamification. Are you Absolutely. familiar with that term? Oh yeah. I mean, we hear that a lot, especially when we're out on the road speaking because people want to go, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, we can do this. But you have to make them believe that they could actually take the gamification, which you can use, of course, uh, to not only um, uh, produce things, but also to uh, engage the end user, right? To make it like, here's some badges and hey, here's some recognition, all the same elements of a game, right? There's a common goal, 
There's a scorecard so you can clearly see if you're winning or losing. There's rules and uh, there's a reward for winning. So all those elements can be taught uh, for software development, for video games, for making engines or anything else. And, uh, and that's the thing, to be honest with you. I mean, when Jack first, uh, uh, when I first came on board at SRC uh, at the Great Game of Business, you know, Jack was in the middle of another acquisition, which is, of course, what we've done. We spun off 66 companies since 1983. And um, it was interesting to me to see how my gifts that I was bringing to the company, marketing, branding, identity, you know, all these great things, um, they're like, yeah, that's fine. But what we really need you to do is think like a business person. I'm, I was hurt. I'm like, oh, what, what, what about me? You know, what about all my awesomeness? And the thing is, is they were absolutely right. We got to get over ourselves and say, what makes a great company? And then teach everybody that. And the, the fallacy about open book management is that someone will care. And I think I'm the poster child for that because I really didn't because I didn't understand, you see. And so just throwing the financials open doesn't do anything. Transparency without education is worthless. Gotcha. Okay. So how do you find that critical number? Great question. So sometimes they scream at you. Like if you have 89 to one debt to equity, um, that number is telling you financially you're brain dead. <laughs> so you, that's a critical number. But a lot of times the critical number has to be kind of sussed out. Uh, kind of teased out, if you will. So we actually have a process um, and it's in the new book, Get in the Game, available where fine books are sold. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we actually describe the process because what you do is you take all of the different inputs that we really have in business. So you've got a, a financial input, of course, what are the trends in our business and in our marketplace, that sort of thing. You've got the market itself, you've got operations and you've got people. And so we just actually, when we begin a process of critical number, we actually ask Everyone in an organization, whether you got 10 people or 10,000, will actually do a survey and ask them what they think our big issues are. And if you've ever done a SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, a lot of those same questions will come up because we're asking them, what do they think? You'd be amazed at what mostly what we would call frontline people, anyone dealing with a customer, working with a product on a service. So I'm talking about somebody writing code or somebody making an engine, or somebody that's uh, on the front line in a health clinic right now taking someone's temperature, if they understand their actions and decisions really affect the financial performance and health of the business or organization, for profit or not for profit, we all use the same financial statements, that's the magic, right? It's what do you think it is? And somebody will say, man, it just seems like we ought to have more clinics or we, we should have this or that. You gather all that information and when you consolidate it, what happens is that critical number is pushed to the top because believe it or not, the, the one thing you want to do is drive a weakness out or pursue an opportunity. So right now, somebody might be saying our biggest weakness is we don't have enough cash. You hear this a lot right now. Or the other one might be we need to go acquire another business so that we can grow in the next five years. Could be something like that. Um, I will tell you lately in the last... Uh, uh, six months, you've been, you've had people going from growth to, can I get cash? So it changes too, right? So we say, just pick one for a year, not for all time. Pick one for a year, go after it. People will learn it. I mean, don't you think? So we have weekly huddles around the forecasting model that we do so that we can say, are we going after debt to equity as an example in, in the uh, first critical number in 83? <laughs> don't you think after 52 weekly lessons on moving that number, from 89 to one to something else to the positive. Do you think everyone learned debt to equity as a ratio? Absolutely. People are smarter than we give them credit for. Yeah, that's great. And uh, so we pick one for a year. A lot of people are going through these uh, uh, tough times right now with not enough cash. Uh, clients or customers are you know, just canceling or reneging on deals or just not having the ability to pay. Yeah. So my God, I've had some uh, clients who have been severely affected by the downturn. Uh, yeah. We, we uh, need to adjust. So how, like, let's use me as an example. I have a consultancy helping clients with their SEO with search engine optimization, getting higher rankings in Google. So several uh, big clients had to, uh, cut their spend significantly with me. And uh, of course, 
there's an impact for for me and in, in that so they're trying to reduce costs because it's like one of them lost 50 percent of their revenue in this downturn i can't imagine yeah. them trying to uh uh, deal with this. I mean, uh, my understanding is that they're not even able to cover their payroll with that new revenue number. Wow. Isn't that tragic? And that's something that, that we're really going to, we haven't even begun to hear all those stories yet, but there are so many people who, who were running it so tight and I don't mean tight, like in a good way, but so close to the margins that if they can't cover payroll, that's a big issue because we believe it's, it's really about jobs and people. Um, in fact, six months ago, everybody was complaining they couldn't find people. Unemployment here was 1.7%. Oh, wow, what a different story we have today. So yeah. let me let me go after it this way. You, so I'm in consulting and training too. What's the first thing even we cut out of our budget? It was, you know, training and consulting because we understand it's, a, it's an easy one to cut. A lot of people cut marketing. Now you're going to advise them, well, don't cut marketing. Now's the time to make sure that your brand is out there. I'm sure you're saying to every client, SEO is more important now than ever before because people are searching more than ever before, I would assume. Yeah. And uh, so you got two things, two ways to cut at it. The, uh, the offensive way is to go get more revenue, get creative, start. I'm just going to make something up, Stefan. But what if you said, I'm going to go after not-for-profits. I don't think that's the right play for you, but just let's flow with that and say a whole new segment we haven't had time to mess with before, we'll go after them. So that's offensive. We're going after new revenue. The other one is to cut costs. So for a lot of your listeners, it, you know, people are going, well, I'm going to have to lay people off. Well, are you? You know, the first thing is, now, of course, we're talking to folks all over the nation. What I would say is in Missouri, um, we have a shared work program. So in other words, to keep people from uh, going on unemployment, you can actually negotiate with the state and say, um, I'll pay them for four days, you pay them for one. In other words, we're saving jobs, keeping people at work. The thing is, when this all started, imagine we have 2,000 people in 10 different companies at SRC. Uh, most of them are essential. Great game is non-essential. So we took voluntary 40% cuts and we went out there and looked for all these other programs, right? So you got to look at your business in a whole new way and say, "Let's. In, why do you have to lay awake with it all at night? For those of you with uh, with employees, ask them. You know, if you don't talk to them, they're getting all their information from uh, CNN and the internet and every you know, bad information. So what if you were the one source of information? Said first things first. Let's protect people. Let's take fear out of the workplace. You're going to have a job, or maybe maybe we do have to cut hours or cut salary. We have stories, Stefan, from across the country where people will volunteer for furloughs and other things once they understand what the big picture is. I bet you have some clients that are like, man, if things turn in another 90 days, we'll be back online and all of a sudden you won't have the people you need, right? Right. I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, this is all over the place because people are saying, you know, the unemployment uh, claims are at all time record highs. And I'm going, this is so crazy because of the fact we couldn't find people a few months ago. So I don't know if I'm helping you, but do you see where I'm headed with this is uh, offensively it's go get more revenue and new creative ways and ask your people, what could we do differently? And secondly is to cut back on costs. That's defensively and say, well, what, what is not necessary? I just got off a call earlier today that I thought was awesome. A client was telling us it's about um, the fact they're in the, uh, uh, they, they're like a second tier or third tier, uh, uh, manufacturer for the OEMs like GM, Ford, Chrysler, Toyota, people like that. And of course, with car sales down, what happens to your supply chain? And this guy was saying, it's not a problem. We have plenty of cash. We've been planning on some kind of a downturn. We didn't know it was going to be a pandemic, but we're going to be okay as long as this, this, and this happens. And his team were like going, well, um, are you going to that, that conference? He says, no, the conference has gone virtual. Well, are you going to it anyway? And this is some conference that's industry specific. And they, uh, the guy says, um, well, yeah, I was still going to go. And they go, we'll get your money back. Cause you know, what we're doing is, you know, the snacks that we get in here, we're cutting out the snacks. We'll bring our own snacks for, for, uh, uh, you know, while we're still working here, the idea was they were going, you give up something, we'll give up something. And I just love the story. It has nothing to do with the actual dollars. It's the spirit. These people understood what things were worth. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> so if if we were to focus on I'm just being hypothetical here, let's say this revenue generation and maybe that uh, 
that critical number for my team is billable hours that we hmm. need in order to make profit. Yep. And this is how many billable hours we have for the month so far. And this is how many we need uh, to hit profitability. Yeah. So Do you think that's a, a, I, good, a, a good example of a critical number? I think it's a great example. And the reason is because who owns that number? It's not you. You can say this is what it takes to keep the business going. And let me explain to you why it's important. But what's fascinating is if they own the number, they're much more likely to hit it than if you impose it upon them. So I might approach the story like this. I'd say, guys, here's the reality. This business requires this many number of billable hours just to, just to be at zero, just to make payroll, keep the lights on, whatever it is. Now, if we go above that, hmm, that's a gain. I'm not saying profit share, but perhaps a gain share. If we can make sure the company's stable, maybe it's above break even, and we say these are the investments that we need to make, uh, maybe share the gain after that right? So the company's okay. Maybe we could share that. But just in the first conversation, you could say, how many billable hours do you think is possible right now? And they're going to go, oh, it's, it's this many. Your, your optimists will be way up here, right? And your pessimists will be like, no, there's no way. We better be conservative. And somewhere in the middle, people are going to go, what's realistic? So reasonable, achievable stretch. That's what I ask people, no matter what the metric. I don't care if you're right in code or if it's consulting hours or if you're turning a wrench it is what are you, you're the expert here what do you think is possible and then you do this <laughs> you <laughs> shut up <laughs> it's so hard because you got to let them think about it and they go well i don't know what do you think and you go well you're the one doing it what's possible and somebody will go eight hours a day okay is that possible then, then you go well where could you find this out i love it when people that are doing the work at any level and this could be management as well as frontline folks and you go, how, how, I don't know what the number of billable hours should be for a company of our size. Go look at the associations you belong to. Go look at um, any sort of industry information. Uh, go to your bank and ask for an outrageous sum of money. They'll run your uh, NAICS code and tell you how much you suck, right? Because <laughs> they're going to see how much of a credit risk you are. And they'll show you the high performers, the low performers. And in that, in those metrics, they'll tell you what your margin should be and what your billable hours should be and different things because... There's people out there who are also borrowing money. I know it sounds a little crazy, but it's about high involvement, right? It's about involving as many people as possible in creating the goals because they're the ones that are responsible for executing. So if they feel like they uh, were part owners in the forming of that critical number, then they're going to be more inclined to try and make that number work. I think so. I mean, yeah. to be honest, in, in my past life, you know, being given a number, I mean, I'm a people pleaser. So I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I remember a guy coming to me and saying, Steve, we need $6 million in sales. This is a small family owned manufacturing company. This is what we need. And I went back to my office and I dutifully took out a calculator and created the, you know, the numbers I needed, put them in a spreadsheet. I basically divided the 6 million by 12 back in, loaded the fourth quarter, you know, sure, this is what we're going to do. How are we going to do it was a different question they never asked. And that's the question you should ask first. How are we going to get there? What does that look like? And what do we all need to be doing? Maybe we need some additional help. Maybe we need to cut back a little bit. I mean, there are going to be tough conversations that you have to have, as with anything that's worth doing. And it's going to really test your culture. I mean, you will lose people who say, I don't want to do that. All I want to do is turn that wrench or write that code or take that temperature, you know, and that's okay. They, they can work for my competitor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got it. And now uh, the great game of business was really the book that explained the importance of having open book management, having everybody on the same page and having that critical number and so forth, but it didn't explain all the how. And right. that's where your, your new book, get in the game explains all that how like what sort of uh structures uh, to put into place and how to get those into place how to course correct as needed um, it, it, like for example you mentioned weekly huddles is that something that's in the in the book yeah so jack talked about uh, what what he called the great huddle back in the uh, 1992 book uh, the great game of business and he talked about what they did and and even showed an example of a scoreboard, but not much about you know, the cookbook side. How do you actually build that? And what is the cadence of that? 
accountability looked like. So what we did in Get in the Game was to actually take each of the components, the principles and practices, if you will, and put them into 10 straightforward steps. They are simple. I will not tell you that it's easy because it does take a lot of, you know, leadership and a lot of courage and, and you know, a lot of gotta wanna, as Jack says, <laughs> you, you really have to want this. But when you do it, it's, it's so amazing. It just is the most freeing style of leadership I've ever been around. So in the new book, we, we walk through, as you say, the huddle. It's here's how to structure it. Here's a, a formula to uh, make it work. Here's a typical scoreboard. And also uh, all these tools in each of the 10 step are free and they are available for anyone. So if there's a tool or a template mentioned, it's all for free. And what we're really trying to do is spread the word, you know, really open up uh, the amount of people that are exposed to this. And now more, more than ever, I think it's important. So you said there's 10 steps to this, uh, this uh, methodology or system. Can you uh, go through what those 10 steps are? Man, this is the, this is the best podcast ever. <laughs> you're, you're saying, Steve, tell me what you did. This is great. So you can tell me if my baby's ugly now when we're done. Okay, so, <laughs> so first of all, understand that, um, as I said, the, the idea of the great game of business, the, this operating system is almost 40 years old, right? We're talking way back in 83. Jack didn't write about it for almost 10 years until someone was finally just beating him, you know, saying, we want you to write a book. He says, no, I'm too busy. And they say, we'll give you uh, $55,000 advance. He says, when do you want the book? You know, it's like he went and bought a camshaft grinder with it to keep the business, you know, growing and, and all that. So long story short is, you know, we have to recognize that there's a lot of really smart people that have helped build this over the years. Rich and I just took it and put it into a format. So the 10 steps go like this. It's begin with the right leadership. First of all, you got to reflect on yourself. Are you a, an autocrat? Are you a, a people person? You know, what is your style? And it's not to judge. It's to say that we believe you should have certain characteristics. You're going to be transparent, obviously. You're going to have to have things like vulnerability and humility and, you know, admit you don't have all the answers, but you've got a whole bunch of people that you can harness the wisdom of the crowd, right? So begin with the right leadership, looks at ourselves, and also explains how to create what we call a design team. So you're not doing it alone. You can actually uh, rank them, have them rank themselves. You can also rank them and then compare, see where the gaps are. The second one is share the why before the how. And this is, I mean, this is one of my favorite parts of all because nobody ever told me why we were doing any of this stuff we were doing until I got to SRC. And then it was like, not we make engines or we sell books or we do this. They said, we want to help people create great companies because that's what creates everything, right? The economy in the U.S. is all small to mid-sized businesses. Um, this is where the jobs are created. This is where families are fed and communities are taken care of. Sorry, if I get emotional, just tell me and I'll get a tissue and we'll move on. It's, it's really powerful stuff. So the why before the how is where most people think about purpose and the long-term vision, the noble cause. You know, why do we do what we do? Because if people can understand why they're doing it, they're much more likely to go for it. Uh, the third one is where open book begins. So open the books and teach the numbers. This is where we're talking about literally teaching people for the first time how hard it is to make money. And we give some great exercises in there uh, and, and some great videos as well about how different people have opened the books to their folks, uh, how they've said, here's what a dollar does in, in business. Uh, look how little we have left. And as an example, I, I love this one. It is the average company makes six and a half cents on the dollar. That's the average in the United States. The average employee thinks you make 36 cents on the dollar. That's a huge difference, Stefan. And I'm telling you, it's so true. That's one of the first things we do as coaches. We'll go in and say, hey, how much do you think we make at this restaurant or, or this clinic or whatever, you know, this organization? And, and they'll be like, 50 cents, 75 cents. And you go, we make three cents. What? And then we actually build an income statement with them. It's just very simple. Not, nothing fancy. It's just simple. But where does money come in? Where does it go out? And where, this is what Luca Pazzioli missed 500 years ago, one column for someone's name by every line item. Who owns the number? So if you talk about billable hours, I'm going to break that down and say, hmm, all right, guys, I'm going to own this. Maybe I own revenue or maybe I own admin or whatever. But whoever owns billable hours, I want them on there, you know, on that scoreboard every week. So we've got begin with the right leadership, begin with the why before the how, open the books and teach the numbers. And then we go, what's the critical number? So we actually walk through that process and say, what's the one thing that matters most 
the one thing we really need to go after this year or nothing else matters. Then step five is act on the right drivers. What drives the critical number? So this is where we learn about line of sight. So the people doing the work, and this is at any level, whether it's management or frontline, everybody needs to have clear line of sight to that critical number. So if it was debt to equity, somebody, you know, I'm talking about the early days of SRC, some guy or gal who is grinding a, a crankshaft needs to understand that the amount of oil they use, the abrasives they use, the number of pieces that can't be remanufactured and have to be replaced with new, these are things they may not know before they were just hands. Now they're head, heart, and hands, right? It's, you're the business person, how would you run this camshaft business? And it's powerful. If somebody's doing billable hours, what I like to think about is, if we weren't taken care of, what would we do differently? right? If this was your business, if you were doing this, how would you make more billable hours possible? And it's amazing how that unlocks creativity. Um, so then we've got a uh, critical number, the drivers, and then mini games. So this is the silliest sounding thing in the world, mini games. So it's a miniature version of the great game of business we play in a department or work group. But we take one of those drivers to the critical number and we go to a department and we say, we're going to teach you how to put this into uh, a game and you're gonna create it. We're not, we're just gonna teach you how to do it because people support what they help create. And Stefan, I'm telling you this thing, the average mini game in, uh, in 2019 was $18,500 in increased profitability, the average. And that's just the ones that I kept track of. It's amazing because people come up with stuff you have no idea even happens every day, either saving or finding new revenue, uh, maybe eliminating scrap or waste or, you know, the lack of productivity, the thing is when people own it, they do it. So now you've got everything from, so you're beginning with the right leadership, you've uh, shown them the purpose, the why, we start to open things up and teach them how they affect the numbers, critical number, drivers, mini games. Okay, now, while we're, this is what I like to think of it as sort of two parallel processes. While we are, as a whole organization, playing mini games and sort of learning about the numbers, well, the design team, has to learn how to forecast and that is ugly. So we call it forecasting when you start because what am I, a fortune teller? So we tell people in the design team, we say your job is not to predict the future, your job is to influence it. So every week while everybody else is playing mini games for 90 days, the design team will be huddling, forecasting, right? Working on that idea of we can control our destiny if we can control the forecast. And at the end, we're celebrating our win on the mini games and introducing the huddle to everyone. So as you're going through here, you're going, okay, that's a parallel process. I get it. But when we talk about the huddling and forecasting, there's your next steps in the, uh, um, in the big picture. Um, somebody's going to say, what's in it for me, right? So we plug in, this is my favorite single step of any of them, and that's provide a stake in the outcome. Because I don't know about you, Stefan, but everywhere I worked before, I always knew there was some secret bonus plan. I saw Christmas vacation. You know what I mean? I know there's a bonus plan somewhere. Somebody's getting it. Um, but I never got, you know, it's just impossible to get. And I remember the first time I was involved, I got that courage up to go ask, I want a bonus. How do you know, we got a new baby coming. We just bought a house. I, you know, my car's breaking down all the time. You know, I'm going way back here, baby, when I was making like 28 grand a year. And it was hard, man, because I'm like going any extra money would help. So picture that. And then having the boss say, um, First of all, the, the first year I asked, they said, what bonus plan? That's how quiet it was in a family owned business. You know, it's like, no, there's no bonus plan. The second year they knew I was working real hard, right? I mean, I was just, my dad raised us kids with like asses and elbows. That was the term around our house. That's all I want to see is asses and elbows. So I went in there just hammering away, you know, ignorantly hammering away, doing the best I could. And when I finally got a bonus, they handed me a check and I was furious. It was five grand minus taxes, the most money I'd ever held in my hands, but I thought it was going to be 20. I don't know if you caught that, Stefan, but I made 28 and I thought I was going to get a bonus of 20. You see how <laughs> I was? But that's, I mean, without information, people will make things up. And I'm not an idiot. I was just ignorant. So in provide a stake in the outcome, this is our uh, really important step. It, it includes short-term, mid-term, and long-term rewards, but we teach you how to do a self-funding bonus right? So now everybody's got a common goal, the critical number. We base our bonus plan on the critical number. So if we can reduce debt, we've actually increased everything good about the business, right? We've got better cash flow. We've got a low, you know, there's 
tons of great things, but wait, what if you're not in an 89 to one situation? What if you're actually doing pretty well? Wouldn't it be great if people were forecasting their own bonus instead of waiting for you to tell them what it was? Then there's no more of this bitching and moaning behind the scenes, right? Where it's like, I, I can't believe that guy. He's driving a new car and lives up in the hills and blah, blah, blah. You hear this everywhere. Because I, I know I was that guy. I was Clark W. Griswold assuming everything because I didn't know anything. Do you remember that movie? No. Which movie was that? Christmas Vacation. Oh, okay. That was a long time ago. <laughs> it is, yeah, it was so I'm just going to ask you and all the listeners, do you happen to remember what the premise of the movie was? Uh, no, I don't. So Clark W., a lot of people like going, it was the bonus. It, was, no, it wasn't the bonus. It was he was digging a hole for a pool he could not afford based on a bonus he didn't even know he would get. How many Clark W. Griswolds do we have in our organization every day? Don't let them be like me. Don't let them make the stories up in their heads because it just leads to disappointment and rancor amongst your, your folks. But what we really want to do is when we open things up, we say, here's the goal. And if we hit the goal, these are the financial uh, after effects that we'll get. That includes a bonus plan. Holy cow. Now you're talking because if you said the next level and we do it in percent of salary, so everybody gets the same percentage. So the CEO and a frontline employee can be in the same bonus plan and all self-funding. Because if it's 6% of salary, well, obviously someone who makes more is gonna get more dollars, but the percent is exactly the same. We're all in the same game. And we show people what they do. We don't share salary information, but we do show the bonus plan because I want someone to say, I wanna earn more because I'll get more bonus next time. That has people aspiring to take training, get more certification, become more qualified, stay longer. Am I getting too excited here? No, this is great. And okay. so, <laughs> Uh, we're, we're, what step are we at right now? Well, let's see, that would be six. So seven is, um, is keep score where we teach you how to create your first scoreboard so you can forecast the numbers and in step eight. So seven and eight, um, I may be off there. I know I wrote it, but help me out. Do you here? Let me do this. I want to make sure I got you on the right page. So we've got, um, cause you got the book right there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm taking the on seven. And then uh, eight and nine kind of go together for me. Keeping score, that's where we do the scoreboards. And then follow the action, that's the huddling and forecasting. And we split those into uh, two chapters because huddling and forecasting go together. The scoreboard is about building the scoreboard in the forward-looking fashion. And so that is a simplified uh, set of financial statements, if you will. We always start with the income statement so people can learn how simple it is that money flows through a business. Um, and then the, uh, the, the last step, after we learn all of these things is what we call high involvement planning. And so step 10 is literally where we create an annual renewal because each year we want to reflect on our leadership, realign to our true north, right? That why our noble purpose, establish a new critical number, continue our teaching of the numbers, create a new scoreboard, a new bonus plan. And that way it's always fresh. I mean, for nearly 40 years, Jack has been able to keep people engaged around what would seemingly be a pretty boring business, making engines and engine components. <sighs> Right. I mean, it doesn't sound sexy, but hmm. man, people come from all over the world to Springfield to go through workshops and tour our factories just because they can't believe it's real. And it's something else, man, I'll tell you. Yeah. So speaking of uh, how real the success is, it started with an 89 to one debt to equity ratio. And uh, where is that? Where give us a few milestones. Where's the business now? But where did it uh where did he make the big turnarounds? Like what was the big milestone in the uh, uh, late eighties or wherever? What a great question to ask, because first of all, it wasn't a big turnaround. I mean, they even wrote about him in Inc. Magazine back in 86 about the turnaround because no one could believe you could come back from 89 to one. But in reality, that was probably the biggest swing um, financially because it was so bad and they, they got it to where they could actually, you know, write the, the ship. But Jack's big philosophy is not rapid growth. It's consistent, healthy growth. So his goal has always been 15% a year across all the different companies, meaning consolidated under SRC Holdings, which we're all part of that and we're employee owned, by the way. Um, the uh, interesting thing is, is that at 15% a year, you're doubling every five years, right? So the beauty of it is consistent growth over 40 years. An easy way to look at the uh, generation of wealth would be like this. If you put a thousand bucks in the markets back in 83 today, you'd have about, well, let's say pre COVID you'd have about 33 grand 
in your uh, in your account. That's not too shabby. Warren Buffett now, he would have given you for the same thousand in 83, would have given you $400,000, right? Huge difference. But every $1,000 at SRC today is worth 7.6 million. It's utterly astounding. Mm -hmm. And I always ask myself, you know, I talk about this every day in my life and I'm going, why didn't I find this when I was 20? <laughs> why? And that's why we're doing it, man. That's why we write the books and we do the speeches and go on podcasts is because we, if we can just reach a few more people and I'd like to catch them young, like my kids and say, there is so much potential, especially in the U S but so much potential in business. We just have to teach it differently. It's not about KPIs and it's not these days. I bet you do interviews with people all the time who say, I've got a new tool and I've got a new system and I've got a new this and a new that. And what's cool is we use all that stuff. I mean, in a manufacturing organization, you can't not do lean, right? There's always great apps. But the funny thing is, the more I meet people who are in my business, consultants keep coming up with new tools to do business the old way, command and control. Why don't we transform it? It's time to reinvent it and say, let's reinvent capitalism while we're at it. What if we taught people the measures of success and expected them to do something, hold them accountable and have them hold one another accountable, but give them a stake in the outcome? It's a totally different conversation. Yeah, sure is. And so y you've been uh, an employee owner of SRC since the day that you joined, or yeah. did you have to earn into it over a period of um, a year or something? I love your questions because they're more insightful than, than most. Um, so the real deal is that our employee ownership structure is we are an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan, which is an you know, an ERISA governed retirement plan. The difference between that and a pension is that we're actually able to influence the value of it because it's based on our stock price. So in 2005, when I joined, um, I had to wait, I had to work a thousand hours and then I was allowed into the ESOP at a certain, I think it's two times a year you're allowed in. Um, and then from then on, I've been, uh, uh, you know, earning shares and uh, driving the stock price, man. That's my whole thing is, how far can we get? Because it's insane. <laughs> it's, a, it's just so funny that I go, was I just in a hamster wheel in the first part of my career? And I think I was. I was just, you know, running the rat race, doing the thing, charging up credit cards, doing this and that. You know, I wasn't bad and I wasn't um, stupid, but ignorance, man, ignorance. That's what we're trying to fight here. Yeah. Now, so you're uh, a, a essentially an investor in SRC, right? But is it something that's liquid or is it something that you have to, like, uh, normally yep. there, there's this, this uh, trajectory where it eventually ends with the company going public and everybody, uh, you know, with big piles of money uh, walking off into the sunset. So is there a strategy <laughs> here to take these 66 companies and make them all go public or, uh, like what's so, the end game here? Now you've gotten to step number two, the why before the how. Okay. Jack wants to transform the way business is done. And at SRC in particular, he wants to create a place where, in fact, he just wrote a new book. If I may um, do a plug on it, it's called change the game. So ours is get in the game. He says, change the game. And it's, it's um, all about stories of people from every walk of life, not for profit, for profit, healthcare, government, higher education, all practicing the game. And the subtitle is my favorite thing in the world, saving the American dream by closing the gap between the haves and the have nots. So Jack created SRC to save jobs originally, right? Those 119 jobs. Then when he figured that out, it was to create jobs, create wealth, share the wealth with those who created it. So going public is not really our first thought. In fact, I'll tell you a few years ago, there was a special task force created because um, a, a very large equipment company that makes big yellow machines came after us and said, we want to buy you. And, and basically Jack said, as an ESOP, we believe it or not, the trustees of an ESOP have to make the best decision for the shareholder, right? Well, in our case, the shareholders are the people that work there. And uh, there was no doubt about it. There's very, we probably left, I don't even want to make, get, make a guess at how many millions but um, a lot was left on the table because we could have gone private equity, could have gone public, uh, could have been bought out by a competitor, right? But we chose to stay employee owned because, and Jack calls it the price of culture. 
He said, this is, we've done amazing things here. We don't need to be that company because we know, in fact, I could, I could tell you about different people in the energy business and, um, and uh, software, different people that have used the great game of business through the years or some form of open book that have created massive wealth. I mean, just so much further than SRC. But what Jack has said is we're going to share the wealth with those who created it and the ESOP and this steady growth. That's what he's really after is how many people can we help create lives that they really want. So the American dream probably sounds a little silly, but uh, I, no, I kind not of, at all. <laughs> sounds a little romantic. I like it is. It, it I is. Like it. I don't think it's soft either because I think Jack is probably the most competitive guy I have met in my life. And I've had the privilege of meeting a lot of very, very wealthy individuals, but Jack will win. I mean, he goes, man, let's play to win. Let's not play not to lose. <laughs> Very insightful. So uh, one of the goals that you mentioned in, while we were kind of chatting before uh, recording was uh, this goal of, of helping 10 million small businesses. 10 Can million you, lives. So 10 we're million actually, lives. Okay. Yep, to the employees as well. Um, as you know, and it's, it's a, uh, a specific guess. How's that sound? We go by the number of companies that we uh, uh, work with and that we have contact with that, that are actually making a move. So we estimate we're around three and a half million right now, and we still have seven years to go. We really want to make sure that we hit that number, or exceed it, because it, by going to the, the front line, and I hope that term doesn't bother anyone. I ran into someone at a conference that you can't talk about front line. I'm like, no, oh, if, if business is a, is a war, you know, we want people on the front line because they're the ones doing the job. Or if you want to think of, you know, manufacturing, then front line would be someone on the floor. The idea, though, is those are the people creating the numbers in the business. The CEOs do not create the numbers in the business. It's the people doing the work. And yeah. again, it goes for any type of work at all because the decision to do one thing rather than another is based on do they think like an owner. And Stefan, if you'll allow me, I should say something uh, to everybody that's listening that when I talk about ownership, it doesn't mean that you have to be employee owned. I'm a huge advocate. I'm a huge believer. I've, I've actually generated more wealth or we have for me um, in the last 15 years than I did, did in the, if I just draw a line from when I got out of school to now, I'm, I'm dwarfing all of that, dwarfing all of it, just because, you know, the, num the numbers are crazy. You can build so much wealth in business if you understand equity. Bottom line, though, is not everybody gets to do it. In the U.S., what are there, 7 to 10 million companies, something like that? Uh, only about 7,000 share broad-based uh, employee ownership. So we're a tiny speck. It's just not normal. And so a lot of folks out there are going, I don't, I don't think I can do that. I don't want to do it. I'm not ready to do it. It's just one exit strategy. But see, what, what's beautiful about Jack is he's going, it's not just about the money. It's about lives. So if you believe that that's different, you can go an employee ownership way. But everything we've talked about applies to anyone else. 85% of the people that practice open book management will never share equity. It's not in their plan. So what we're looking at is it's ownership up here, not just in the wallet. It's, it's an ownership mindset. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, when you shared that 10 million lives that you want to impact, uh, through what you guys are doing that reminded me of Gino Wickman, who was just on my podcast uh, a few weeks ago. And he shared his goal. I think it was 1 million businesses or 1 million entrepreneurs or something like that. He's trying to help entrepreneurs to nice. uh, you know, get, get started. Make sure yeah, that, I'm first of all, that they are truly entrepreneurs because he's got those seven uh, traits of the entrepreneur. Make sure that you're built for it because they're only apparently 5% of the population that's really built to be an entrepreneur. And uh, if you are a fit, then to help you to, to step up and then succeed once, uh, that's, once you've made that choice. Yeah. So there's a good example. Take Gino's book traction or EOS and, and take it to the next level. If you practice that, or you're thinking about it, whether you play the great game or you do scaling up, the thing is, there are different ways to approach business and operating system. The challenge is, who's doing it? And are we out to enrich the, the one or the few, or are we going to enrich the many? I'll tell you, you know, there's that old saying about, 
you know, with the rising tide, all ships rise or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Doing it. But the funny thing is, is it works and you can outpace the market by huge factors. I mean, I don't want to even take a guess for you because if I, if I use SRC's stock price as an example, it's not really fair. Not everyone's going to have that kind of performance. But, but the trick is it's all about leadership. Leadership, leadership, leadership. Well, what if we taught leadership to people at every level of the business and, and trusted that they could learn business, but there's still a wall. For some reason, it's all about command and control, right? I'm going to, and I'm not picking on any particular system. They all kind of look at it the same way. It's we're here. They are here. How do we get the, oh, we'll give them KPIs and OKRs and all oh, of the metrics are going to be amazing, but nobody seems to say, here's how we make money and generate cash. Could you help? I'll give you a piece. Nobody talks about that, but the great game. So my challenge would be use whatever system you love because then you'll use it, use it with discipline and then go to the next level. When you're comfortable with the business, start teaching it to others. Yeah. Help them to be invested in your success and not just yeah. see it from the sidelines. Stefan, you said something really interesting earlier. You said, so you're an investor, so to speak, in SRC. And I mean, I know you just said it, but I want to, it just triggered me because I go, you know, what's funny is, that's what most people have in their business is an investor mentality. Meaning even if you don't share equity or anything else, investors expect you to drive their stock price. Owners hold themselves accountable. So mm -hmm. that's why we're trying to get the ownership mindset all the way through the organization. Otherwise, Cause I don't want to haul them all around, you know, have them say, go Steve, go. I, I love it when I walk through one of our factories and you see somebody walking down, you know, the aisle with their name on their shirt. I'm like going, Hey, Bill, hit that stock price, man. And he'll be like, Baker, you get out there and talk about it. Man. It's just like, it's so awesome. You know, yeah. have a couple thousand people behind you knowing that I might be in a lonely hotel one more night, but man, when I talk about it, you can tell, man, it just lights me up and I know they've all got my back and I've got theirs. That's great. So how do you teach the great game of business to kids? Because kids these days are learning just the most antiquated obsolete information in school and uh, they're not learning the basics of entrepreneurship, of uh, negotiation, of time management. Like, they'll never hear the term OKRs ever as a, <laughs> a kid in school. So right. how would you uh, kind of inspire them and, and uh, deliver this kind of wisdom? to the younger generation? Well, I will tell you the one thing that, that unifies every business and organization around the world. In fact, when I speak, I, I'll throw up a Chinese balance sheet and it's of course in Mandarin or Cantonese or I don't know, I don't speak Chinese, but the amazing part is I go, can you read it? And you know, you'll have 400 people there at an Inc. Magazine conference or something and they'll go, no. And I go, well, does it balance? And of course you can see it balances. I'm going to see that the thing is those financials that Luca Pazzioli created back in 1494, any culture, language, um, political boundaries, geographical boundary, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. You can't dig a well in Africa for water without it showing up on a balance sheet somewhere in the World Bank or someplace, you know, and we, we even started a social sectors part of our business to help uh, big brothers, big sisters and, and uh, you know, community theaters and all that. So you're asking me about the kids. What I want to tell you is the, the first thing I would do is what Jeff Evenson did, a friend of mine in St. Louis. He got $14,000 in $1 bills from his bank. It took two weeks to get them. <laughs> he had to order them. He took them home. And, and I have picture the, uh, pictures of this, by the way, Stefan. You, you would just, it'll bowl you over. Three kids, small kids. He piled it in the front room. He and his wife had a uh, whiteboard with... Um, different categories of expenses and a post-it note on each one that had a specific expense under the post-it note was an amount. 14 grand represented their gross income for the month, the family's gross income. And what's powerful about it is he made the kids count it out. And so they had to count these stacks of money. They'd, they'd peel off a post-it note and they'd stick it on the money and, and they'd go 1900 and whatever. So they learned about taxes and they learned about, you know, I remember my oldest when he turned 16, this is years ago, he uh, came to me and said, who's FICA? <laughs> I'm like, what? this is great. A conservative is born. No, I'm kidding. The, the thing is, it, it's about money. I never taught him what that meant, right? And that's on me. So what I'm saying is Jeff went through the, every expense. And at the end, 
perfect little stacks and the conversations weren't about, I had no idea my tuition that was much. It was, how come Susie's pile for club volleyball is this big and mine for club soccer is this big, right? Now we're starting to go, ah, they're starting to care. My kids took Dave Ramsey training in high school. It was a pre or not a prerequisite. What do you call it? It was an, um, not an elective. It was part of their learning. What's funny is that two of the three um, remember it uh, and have started. I've re kind of connected them with those ideas because Dave's great. We love him. He's great with personal finance. Um, the My youngest, though, who's 19, he just went through it, right? This is his first year in college. He doesn't remember even taking it. So what I'm saying is you, you can't teach in one lesson. So what Jeff is, Jeff is the guy from St. Louis I told you about. He hasn't been um, bringing $14,000 in ones home all the time, but he keeps adding to, do you remember when we did that? Here's something else and here's something else. And today his kids uh, are just starting college. It's just great to hear, you know, the, uh, that they understand what student loans are, what interest, how it works. It's a cumulative thing, Stefan. And I would say start with the basics. Um, a lot of churches do uh, three piggy banks, uh, save, give, spend. And you, you know, little kids can put their nickels and quarters and dimes and that sort of thing. But um, I, yeah, my thing is, man, just start teaching at any level, even if they're adults and don't stop. Just keep talking about it. They'll thank you later. Mm. I love that example that you shared of Jeff uh, with the $14,001 bills. Makes it very tangible. Very, very tangible. That much money has a smell. <laughs> well, smell. In these days, uh, it would have, a, 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 with those many bills, <laughs> there'd be virus on that for sure. <laughs> for sure. You're, yeah. Statistically, <laughs> you would have a COVID pile. So maybe we don't do it with uh, real money. I don't know. But it sure makes a, an impact. And what's funny is, what I didn't tell you is one of the uh, industries I was in before I came to SRC was in the bath and body world. So um, what, one of the things I learned in studying all about, you know, what would make uh, really good products and everything is that scent is really closely tied to memory. And so that's why you smell something, you go, oh, that reminds me of grandma. Or, you know, you smell something else, it reminds me of that great day at the amusement park or whatever. And that what's funny is the smell of money, right? He's implanted that permanently in his kids. So if they actually use cash, which, you know, they're probably all Venmoing and everything now, but... Every time they smell cash, I have a feeling that somewhere there's a cog that just slips into place and they go, hey, yeah. am I spending this right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder what the smell of Bitcoin is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like another podcast. <laughs> uh, awesome. Okay. So, because um, when you were talking about um, the, the story with Jeff and the, the dollars and all that, uh, it reminded me also of um, uh, a new client of mine. It's first, myfirstsale.com, and their premise is to be essentially like the Etsy for kids, where they could uh, make things and then sell the things. It's a marketplace, and it uh, helps the parents to, it provides a framework for how those kids can make money as kids. Yep. That's and uh, yeah, so there's just so much opportunity there for, uh, um, maybe, maybe there's some collaboration that you guys could do. <laughs> no, it sounds good. You know, you said something about um, we aren't teaching kids to be entrepreneurs. And I think about all the people that I know who started out mowing lawns or doing some otherwise, what you know, some might consider menial childhood tasks or something. But what's interesting is, is that at the college level, and Jack is really passionate about this right now, um, we are teaching kids the wrong way to get into business and entrepreneurship. And what he means by that is, and I see it even at our own local universities, and we got five of them in Springfield, um, there are actually um, you know, incubators that say, here's how you do it. You go raise as much money as possible, and then you do this and you do this. The whole thing is based on debt in the beginning, right? The idea of just taking it on. And, and Jack's going, man, you know, now he started in debt. He's like, this is the worst thing you could possibly do because the way he's going to teach you is... Uh, how quickly can you have an overhead absorber and a cash generator? <laughs> People ask him, what's your secret to creating so many companies? And he just says those two things over and over. Simple formula, but man, it's really powerful. So we just keep saying, let's try to teach kids that business is not evil, that profit is not a four-letter word, that you can actually do good with it. In fact, you can do more good with it. I love our social sector. Our, uh, we've been getting these letters in and emails from people um, in the not-for-profit sector, both like charities 
if you will, but also our own Greene County government. A number of years ago, they were on the brink of bankruptcy. And, you know, look, when you're in Springfield, if, if you've golfed with Jack, people will say, oh, yeah, I know open book management because, like, apparently it works through osmosis. I know it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and so if they've met Jack, they think they're doing it. And Jack's too humble to go, you need to do this, right? Well, when Greene County, Missouri was in such bad straits, they came and, and said, you know, we need help. And so we just put some of our coaches on it. And uh, we said, you know, this is where we live. This is our community. Let us help. And I'm telling you that they, in a year, they turned it around. There's so many great stories, Stefan, that, that I could share. But my favorite, if I may, is um, uh, Jack, so I guess a janitor or maintenance worker from the county. First of all, that when this happened, people had not had raises in more than five years. Can you imagine what that would feel like? And they didn't, no one knew what revenue really meant. You know, that we have to, they had people voting against tax levies, which is their own revenue. You know what I'm saying? It's like they didn't connect the dots. So long story short, they didn't raise our taxes wildly or anything. They just started to implement and get everybody concerned, like, well, where, where, where's the waste? And where can we get more revenue? And how do we do this? And how do we do that? And then um, they turned it around. They were able to get in a position now where they're, we got a letter from them saying, Cindy Stein, the, uh, uh, our main contact with the county said, uh, you know, we would not have survived this crisis. We wouldn't have if we wouldn't have been set up to do so. Well, now all of our people are working and they're essential, right, for our community. And that includes the sheriff's department and all kinds of different things you don't think about, you know, the street construction and all kinds of things. But the, the best story was a, a, a maintenance worker came up to Jack and said, I just want to tell you what I did. And this is the best part about great game of business is that when you get somebody who's gotten turned on and they go, I've worked here for over 20 years and uh, we use this cleaning solution. It comes in a 55 gallon drum. And when we started to learn about the money, I didn't know those drums just, you know, when I ran out, a new one came. Well, now that we understood what it cost, I read the label on the side and it says dilute 10 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> so 20 years of waste, 10 times the waste. And he took pride in the fact that I found this and this and this, right, all kinds of different things. And they're helping one another say, wow, what if? So if a government can do it, oh my gosh, you know, your, your mind goes to places, right? What if? the trillions of dollars. What if, man, I hope we can get some young kids turned on and say, let's go make a change in all the different sectors. Yeah. That reminds me of a story I heard from another guest, um, Scott Eck. He told me that when they were working on the, on the space shuttle back in, in the seventies, I think they were trying to figure out how to get the uh the, the space shuttle under a certain weight it was mm -hmm. well it was overweight and it was a big big problem well it was the guy at the gate who came up with the answer because he, he kept seeing the uh brainiac engineers coming in and and leaving every day there was only one person out of that group of engineers was at all kind to this guy and actually said hello and stuff. Everybody treated him like he was just a nobody. Yep. And uh, so one day this engineer is explaining the problem. Like we, we've tried everything. We don't know how to get uh, more uh, weight off of the space shuttle and it can't launch. And he, the guy looks, the, the gate guy looks at the, uh, the thing because it's outside. He's like, don't don't paint the the uh, um, the booster rockets. <laughs> I love it. And so I, he was doing the math on there. He's like, oh my god, that's it. That'll wow. that that's the amount of weight that it'll save is good. It, that that fixes it. That yeah. is amazing. See, that's oh my gosh, that's the wisdom of the crowd, right? It's yeah. the stories like that, or the guy who says, you know, the truck got stuck under the bridge. Well, let the air out of the tires. Oh, okay. You know, it's like, why didn't we think of that? But that's what Jack has tapped, right? It's that, that uh, frontline person, that middle manager, that guy who's on the road, you know, what are the decisions being made? They're making them because they have no information, no real information. They're being told, do this, do that. But that guy at the front gate, man, he just, just creative, right? You've yep. got to have a way, a system to tap it and to harness it 
rather than letting it fly off and have that guy go home to his wife every night. I know how to do this and they won't listen to me, you know, angry all the time. Gosh. Right. But I don't think that gate guy got any money for that brilliant no. idea. <laughs> but you know what? That's actually a good point. But I bet he still got to have a nice career at NASA. He probably got some good recognition and he helped create an organization that would last for, for decades upon decades. So the yeah. thing is, does it all have to be money right now? And that's another thing that, you know, we've just spoiled our kids and we need to teach people of a young age that get engaged, learn the basics, and then let's do something new and different and, and awesome together. And if we can kind of beat the enti entitlement monster, I don't know how, but we can do it one person at a time, 10 million lives. We're just, we're doing it one life at a time. Yeah. So if, if folks wanted to learn this whole system and apply it in their lives and their businesses, uh, they don't even have to be the business owner. They could go to the boss and, and present the plan. Uh, so they would start with the book, Get in the Game, I'm guessing. And you mentioned I've, that yeah. there's some book, uh, along with the book, there's some videos. Yes, absolutely. So every, uh, you can go to greatgame.com. Um, in fact, if you go to greatgame.com slash Steve, um, there's a sample of the book for you there uh, and some other goodies that are free. Um, but in the book, Get in the Game, there's a whole, uh, each step has tools, templates, um, exercises. So all that is free. Um, and you can get the book anywhere, of course. Um, the, the, the big thing is, is that within the system, um, you can do, we have courses, we have coaches all around the world. Um, depending on what level of implementation you want to do, you know, you might just read the book, you might use the free resources, uh, you might hire a coach, but we also do workshops that are virtual. We do uh, workshops that are in person. So you come to SRC and you actually live the experience and sit in a real live huddle and go on a tour and that sort of thing, meet Jack. And then um, one of the things that we'd created uh, this fall as part of our contingency planning, we said, what if there's a big recession, right? We've been planning on this for 10 years because we knew something was going to happen. We didn't know it was going to be the black swan of COVID. But, um, but if we hadn't been working on it, you know, in the, in the background, we recorded all of the material and we have an on-demand kind of self-directed course as well. So get in the game is available, you know, do it yourself. Uh, do it on demand or do it in person, hire a coach, you know, all different ways. It's yeah. very accessible. Yeah. Well, you mentioned this black swan. So that concept is that, you know, something unpredictable and major comes to, to pass. But one thing that was very predictable was the long-term debt cycle. Yep. It was just a matter of time, 50 to 75 years, according to Ray Dalio. He's got a great... Um, a YouTube video explaining how uh, the economy works and explaining the short-term debt cycles and the long-term debt cycles. We are at the end of a long-term debt cycle. So it's, of course, a big downturn. And it just got uh, kicked off because of the pandemic. Exactly. So it's, what's really interesting is I recently found a video, uh, an interview on Bloomberg with uh, Nassim Taleb, the guy who wrote the black swan. Did you see this? He said, no. this is not a black swan. It's a white swan. We could see this coming. In fact, I predicted it in 2007, a pandemic. I'm like, holy cow, I got to reread that book because this guy's smart. It's all stuff that can be figured out, right? It could all be figured out if we're smart enough. And we understand instead of hiding in our little hidey holes, it's get out there and go, what's the reality? Talk to an economist, read something that's more than, you know, the, the guide for a penny dreadful season eight or so. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> something, you know, get smart, man, and make it fun. And Jack has made me, it just, he just took a creative guy and turned him loose with some new information. And now I just can't shut up about it. <laughs> oh, that's great. It's great to see the enthusiasm, the passion, and uh, you're changing lives, yeah, getting sure. getting closer every day to that 10 million. Every so. day. And this podcast helps. Thank you, Stefan. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing all that passion and wisdom and experience with my listeners. So uh, again, it's greatgame.com. And then the special kind of uh, uh, bonuses are at greatgame.com slash Steve. And uh, if you could also share with me afterwards the uh, Nicholas Taleb YouTube video, I'll include that in the show notes. I'll include the Ray Dalio economics ex explainer Ooh. video. 
uh, in awesome. the show notes as well. The, of course, the books will be uh, linked in the show notes and uh, everything else that we uh, went over will be in the show notes, even a full transcript. So we'll catch you on the next episode of Get Yourself Optimized. Thank you so much and have a great week.